Time to take a look at the A4 rocket, better known as the VTU, or V2 in German. The E was short for Vergeltungswaffe, which means retribution or vengeance weapon. Although some claim the V is for Verzweiflung, desperation might be better suited. In this video we take a short look into its origins, development, technical data and finally its effectiveness. The official designation for the weapon was A4, which is quite interesting because you probably suspect it was a weapon of the Luftwaffe. But Luftwaffe designations were along the lines of BF-109, FW-190 or FE-103, better known as the V1. So that begs the question, was this just the odd designation or was this not a weapon of the Luftwaffe? Well actually it was a weapon of the army, which is at first quite surprising. Now you probably want to know why did the army develop a long range rocket? Well, this goes back to the Treaty of Versailles that had heavy restrictions on artillery, yet rockets weren't really covered. So the army invested even before Hitler's rearmament into an alternative to supplement and or replace artillery. And without that investment it would probably never existed that early. Because the industry had little interest in rockets at that time, thus the army funded the early development. One of the precursors of the A4 was the Aggregat 1, which means aggregate or assembly 1 and from which the following model's names were derived. Original development was performed at Kummersdorf, which was the main testing facilities of artillery. But soon it became clear that more space was needed to test long-range rockets. For this, the Heeres Versuchsanstalt Pinneminde next to the Baltic Sea was constructed. Note that this facility was co-financed by the Luftwaffe. Now in March 1939, Hitler was shown the engine of the related A5. Towards a request for funding he responded that he wants a development plan from blueprints to troop introduction. And shortly after the victory against Poland in fall 1939, the project was declared not necessary for the war effort. And thus resources were cut, additionally funding was reduced to 50% for 1940. Nevertheless, in March 1940 the first engine was tested. About a year later, in March 1941, the project received the highest priority due to the change of the war situation. Yet one year later, in March 1942, the priority was reduced again. At this time, the first complete rocket was tested, but exploded. Several failed attempts later, in October 1942, the first successful flight with a range of 190 km was performed. Consequently, or maybe inconsequently, in 1943, the project received more attention again and became the largest weapons project of the Third Reich in the second half of the war. Hitler wanted a weapon to avenge against the Allied bomber attacks and also prepared to defend the occupied territories in Europe. In February 1943 a production schedule which was aimed at the production of 5150 rockets until December 1944 was created. Additionally, in March 1943 a commission decided on the future of the Luftwaffe's V1 and the Army's V2. The result was that they concluded that the weapons complemented each other and thus both should be produced and they received the highest priority again. Yet Allied bomber attacks had major research and production facilities in summer 1943, thus the production was moved into underground facilities. Now before we take a short look at the operational history, let's take a glimpse at some of the technical specifications. Note that the technical data varies quite a bit. I compared the main source with Sologus book and Wikipedia and while well, there are different values for almost everything, so take these values with a grain of salt. The length was 14,026 mm and it had a diameter of 1,651 mm. The four wings were adapted in a size so they could fit for a railway tunnel. Without fuel the weight was 4,075 kg. The launch weight was around 12,900 kg. The rocket was fueled with 3,710 kg of a 75% mixture of methanol and water. And as a second part 4,900 kg fluid oxygen which had a temperature of minus 183 degrees Celsius. Which also meant that if there was a delay during operation that some parts of the rocket could freeze up. Thus resulting in the most expensive and explosive popsicle of the Third Reich. Additionally there were two smaller loads for fueling the turbine that pumped the regular fuel into the engines. Originally the head of the rocket could carry 738 kg of explosives. Since in its flight the A4 passed several layers of air, the temperature could rise up to 680 degrees Celsius. Thus an explosive was used that wasn't too heat sensitive. Later an additional 240 kg of explosive were added. Thus the war had reached a weight of almost 1 ton. For the launch the A4 was brought into vertical position. The initial burn was used to observe if the combustion was according to specification. 
About three seconds later the rocket would take off. Another five seconds later the rocket switched into its flight pattern. Once it reached its altitude of about 29 kilometers, the fuel supply was stopped and the warhead armed. Yet the rocket was still climbing to an altitude of around 90 kilometers until it turned toward its target. In other terms, after 63 seconds the rocket reached a maximum velocity of 1500 meters per second. And it had a total flight time of around 320 seconds, at a range of around 300 kilometers. Originally it was planned to launch the rocket from a major bunker complex in northern France. But it was heavily bombed during its construction. Another bunker followed the same fate and after D-Day the idea of bunkers was ditched. Instead mobile launch platforms were used. The first major use of the A-4 was in September 1944, with 156 rockets fired at various targets in England, Belgium and France. In total a bit more than 6000 rockets were produced. The number vary quite a bit depending on the sources. And of those around 3710 rockets were fired until the end of the war against targets in England, Belgium, France and the Netherlands. Of those around 1054 hit England, although only about 38% of VDUs fired on London reached the target. Another 1261 V2 hit Belgium and France. Now the question is how effective was it? For this we look at the destruction cost, the investment in countermeasures and operations by the Allies and the resources used by Germany. In terms of destruction cost you probably guess from the rather low number of rockets produced and even less fired the destruction was rather limited. Note that I don't count civilian losses or destroyed houses here, because those had rather little effect on the war effort. There were various cases in which military personnel was wounded or killed. I will list now some of the most destructive incidents I could find. One was when a cinema was hit and 490 British soldiers were wounded or killed. In two other cases there were severe losses in fuel. In one case one and a half million liter of fuel was lost in Leash. And in another about 3500 tons of fuel and antwerp were destroyed. Of course there were many smaller incidents but the numbers were similar or below. So in short the damage was very limited. This becomes even more obvious if we look at the number of explosives delivered by the V1 and V2 together against England in a 10 month period. Which was about 5900 tons. To put this number in perspective, the Luftwaffe dropped from August 1940 to June 1940 a total of 53,000 tons of bombs in 11 months. So even by early war standards, the amount of explosives the V weapons delivered was very limited. Another aspect of course is the Allied investments to stop the various V weapon projects. Here of course is a major problem that it is hard to determine what was used against the V1 or V2. There were major investments into intelligence and then bomber operations. At certain points the attacks against V weapon size had the highest priorities. This was also due to the fact that at one point the British wrongly assumed that in one month more than 100,000 people could be killed with such attacks. Similarly Eisenhower's statement from 1948 that the German V weapons project could have disrupted the invasion if they would have come earlier and targeted the troops in England is considered incorrect due to the high inaccuracy of the V weapons. Now I have some limited data on bombs and sorties. During Operation Crossbow, which were the systematic attacks against V weapon sites, a total of 20,000 tons of bombs were dropped on V2 related sites. Yet most data is for all V weapons combined. For the period before D Day, around 25,000 sorties were flown, in which the Allies lost 771 men and 154 planes. Shortly after the invasion, the attack on V sites received the highest priority again, after Britain was hit repeatedly with V 1s. In short, although the V weapons caused major concerns for the Allies, the impact on their operations and huge amount of resources was relatively small. Which brings us to the final category, the amount of resources the Germans spent on the V2. In the beginning of 1944, the V2 project used up 200,000 workers, which is about 10% of the whole workforce for the aircraft industry, and 5% of the monthly amount of aluminum used by the Luftwaffe in the end of 1943. Additionally, a lot of high quality radios and electrical equipment was used. According to the Deutsche Reich und der Zweite Weltkrieg, the A4 project cost around 2 million Reichsmark, which is about 25% of the cost of the Manhattan project. Yet Zaloga notes a post war study that listed at 2 billion US dollars, which is about the cost of the Manhattan project. Whereas the source listed in Wikipedia supposedly notes that the V1 and V2 program together cost about 50% more than the Manhattan project. 
Now, as you can see, the numbers differ widely, but I think we can agree that the V2 was a bit overpriced. Another comparison, which also takes into account the complete reworking projects, is from the strategic bombing survey that assumed that about 24,000 German fighters could have been built with the resources the V weapons used. Now, if we compare the V2 to the V1, the V2 doesn't come off very well, neither. The average price of the V2 was, according to one source, 119,000 Reichsmark, with all explosives and fuel, whereas the V1 cost around 1,500 or 5,060 Reichsmark, depending on the source. In any way, the V2 was far more expensive. Yet besides the cost, the V1 had another, yet counterintuitive benefit. Since the V1 could be shot down, it actually did bind enemy troops and equipment. Something the V2 couldn't do, because due to its speed there were no countermeasures during wartime. To conclude, no matter which numbers you take, the V2 project was a huge drain of resources and very little damage and or destruction was caused to the Allies. Considering the rather weak industrial and resource base of Germany in World War II compared to the United States, I would say the V2 was a complete and utter waste of time and money. On the other hand, for the Allies, the V2 project was quite useful. During the war, it diverted a lot of important resources and personnel for more effective projects, and after the war, it had major benefits to the space and continental ballistic missile projects. So in a way, the idea of space Nazis isn't so odd at all. As always, sources are linked in the description. If you want to learn more about World War II, I suggest this playlist, or maybe this video about what the Allies didn't learn from the Spanish Civil War is more to your liking. Anyway, thank you for watching and see you next time.